folks that are supposed to be in charge, the folks, as you said, who are supposed to be the grown up, folks yeah. that are supposed to be the experts, don't know what they're doing and don't yeah. have the answers. And it's up to each and every one of us to to take mm -hmm. on that mantle and to, to be the change that we want mm -hmm. to see in the world. That's Kati Petri Norris, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Hey guys, I'm your host, Kara Duffy, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast, where I invite my favorite humans, the awesome, the up to something, and the extraordinary to come and share their story. I hope that you'll be left entertained, inspired, and moved to take action towards living your most powerful life. Kati Petri Norris is the California State Assemblywoman for the 74th District, my district. Prior to her being reelected this past election, I invited her onto this podcast to discuss what's actually happening in state and local politics, why she ran for office, and to ask her how we can all get more involved. All that and so much more is coming up, but first. Yogazama 200-hour teacher training is the introductory program offered by the Lisby School. It's a psychotherapeutic yoga teacher program that takes traditional yoga and seeps it in scientific tea. Yoga plus brain science equals a whole new level of access to mental health and human optimization. While you're learning the yoga poses, breathing techniques, Ayurveda, meditation, and mantras of a traditional yoga teacher training, you'll also be learning the brain science, neurobiology, and psychology behind why it works and how you can bioengineer a practice or protocol to transform stress, anxiety, sadness, and more. In the same way you would use an essential oil or go for a run or take a hot bath to change your emotional state, in this course, you will learn scientifically proven mind-body techniques to level up yourself or your clients. I just completed my Yogazama 200 certification, and I thought this class would be for my own personal development. And yet, as a business coach, I've used something I've learned every week with my clients. Imagine what you could do with this training. I cannot recommend this program enough. Sign up now to save your space in the 2021 programs and to qualify for 20% off early bird discount pricing. Special bonus, I'll be teaching the business lesson so you'll know how to create either a new business or level up your existing business with your new skills. Visit thelispyschool.com, L-I-S-P-Y, and sign up today. Spots are limited. I'll also include a link in the show notes within this episode. Please tell the audience who you are and um, what you do for the state of California. Well, hi, Kara. I am Assemblywoman Kati Petri Norris. I'm proud to represent California's 74th Assembly District in California's State Assembly, which is one of the two branches of California's legislature. And the uh, 74th District includes a lot of Orange County, right? Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, Laguna. Who else? Yeah. Is there? Yeah. So I represent a, a large part of coastal Orange County. It's Laguna Beach. Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, Costa Mesa, Irvine, and Laguna Woods. And my family and I are, uh, are live in Laguna Beach. Very cool. How long have you guys been in Laguna Beach? We have been here for just over eight years. We, uh, we moved here in 2012. We actually moved. It was, it was a week before my oldest son started kindergarten here, uh, mm -hmm. here in Laguna. Very cool. And are you a California native originally? I am, Kara. So I grew up in, I grew up in San Diego County. I grew up in La Mesa mm -hmm. um, and was born and raised there, went to, to Helix High School. And then I left right after high school and uh, went back east for college. I went to Yale. Mm -hmm. And then I spent 20 years away from California, lived in living and working all over the states and, and all over mm -hmm. the world. And uh, after 20 years, realized that there really is no place like home. And mm -hmm. my uh, my husband and I decided to come back to Southern California. And we, we really do feel like it's our it's our forever home. As you know, you're you're my neighbor. You're just mm -hmm. around the corner in Costa Mesa. Mm -hmm. um, this really is a, a pretty incredible part of the world and uh, such an incredible yes. community. 
It really is. Um, I'm from the East Coast originally, but I've gone back and forth between California and some places on the East Coast most of my life and even lived abroad. And when people ask, like, are you going to move again? I'm like, I don't think so. Like, there's not really a reason to. Like, I, I love traveling. I love being in other places, mm-hmm. whether it's for work or for pleasure. But, you know, when it comes down to, like, where do you want to have a home base? Like, I don't know why you would pick anywhere else <laughs> like, other than affordability. Like, I don't know why you would. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we feel so blessed to have found to have found Laguna Beach and uh, mm-hmm. and really blessed to to be raising our family here. Yeah. Um, and I read in um, doing some research about you that you spent a lot of time as a businesswoman in finance and tech, I believe, is where you were. Um, what made you want to make the leap from being in the corporate environment to being in politics? So as you said, I uh, I spent 20 years working in, in the business world. I mm-hmm. uh, worked for both large and small uh, financial services and, and technology startups, um, both here mm-hmm. and overseas. Um, so I definitely did not come to this job as a career politician or mm-hmm. as a political insider. And I will say that, that I, I think it's been a perspective that's served me really well. So every day I, I show up as a mom, I show up as a businesswoman, and I show up, I think really and truly as a representative of this community mm-hmm. and the folks that that I'm I'm here to serve. Um, and I'll tell you that the decision for me to move from the business world into the political sphere, mm-hmm. the, the tipping point for me really was the the 2016 election. And mm-hmm. and I think it's it's a story that we've heard and we've seen for mm-hmm. women candidates and women elected officials all across California and, and, and all over the country. Um, the, mm-hmm. the 2016 election for me was a huge wake up call. Um, I was horrified. I was, uh, <laughs> deeply, I was just, you know, devastated. I spent you know a couple of weeks just in, in tears and mm-hmm. felt like the world was, you know, kind of plunging into chaos. And, I kind of realized, look, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to spend the next four years being mad or being sad. I'm going to do something about it. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to change the things that I can change um, right here on my doorstep. And and at that time, Mm -hmm. um, the the, uh, gentleman who was representing us in the California State Assembly was cut from the very same cloth, um, in my view, as as Donald Trump, you know, Mm -hmm. denier of science, denier of climate change, denier of, of women's rights, women's right to choose. And he also mm-hmm. was somebody who just wasn't doing anything for this district. He wasn't getting the job done. And I uh, decided that I was going to change that. And um, mm-hmm. so I decided to, to run in in 2018, uh, in the 2018 election, and had just the most incredible, incredible group of supporters and volunteers. And uh Together, we we turned a long shot race into a historic victory in 2018, mm-hmm. and uh, so I was elected for the first time in 2018, and was just reelected in uh, in the November election. Gosh, almost almost four weeks ago, uh, I which know, is it great. Feels like it's feels like it's been ten years at this point. <laughs> it just happened since then. It does. And it it's, was it so traumatic. <laughs> yes. No. Part of what um, had me reach out to you is that we obviously got so much mail during the election Mm -hmm. and the mail that we got for you was the only piece of mail that said anything that we cared about. It actually had like, this is what we're going to do. This is why I'm not getting involved in this nonsense. Like you choose. That's the message I got. And I was like, oh, that's thank you. Thank you for not (laughs) having to be hate mail or anything else. And, you know, hearing about the fact that you came from the business world, um, I saw a lot of parallels between myself and you and feeling like, okay, no one's coming to rescue us. We're going to have to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like, what do we do? And after, you know, leading an organization called Powerful Ladies, I didn't realize the responsibility that was in that fully until this year. Um, we had to pivot so much of creating a membership to support female entrepreneurs. So they could mm-hmm. survive. Um, we launched an entire series of a powerful conversation about America. We did a, a three-part series on racism with, with panelists. We're going to keep that going in 2021. But I woke up like pretty much the day after 
the Black Lives Matter riots like went crazy Mm -hmm. and looked around and I was like, how is nobody stepping up to say something about this? Like you're even just acknowledge it. And being in business, so much of my my perspective is like, who in the business world is going to say something? And then no one said anything. And then so few people in the political space said anything. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what happened where I've woken up and now I'm the adult in the room? Like, mm-hmm. what, what happened? And I feel like so many people are motivated now to see that anything we care about, we have to really be involved in having the conversation. Um, how much of the conversation? I think you're so, I think you're so right. And I think, Mm -hmm. um, and even in his, uh, in his commencement address for the 2020 graduates, Obama said something to this effect where, you know, he said, if we've learned anything over the past two years, it's that sometimes the, the folks that are Mm -hmm. supposed to be in charge, the folks, as you said, who are supposed to be the grownups, the folks that are supposed to be the experts don't know what they're doing and don't have the answers. And, Mm -hmm. It's up to each and every one of us to to take mm-hmm. on that mantle and to to be the change that we want mm-hmm. to see in the world. And it's not enough to just complain about it on Facebook. It's not enough to like you know share an angry re- retweet. We have to get serious about the you know calling bullshit mm-hmm. when we see it and stepping in to to close mm-hmm. those gaps and to to continue to to move. Uh, to move forward. And, um, and I think for me, the last four years have certainly been an incredibly dark cloud, but I really do think Mm -hmm. the silver lining, I think that the the huge silver lining has been the way that particularly I think for so many women, you've seen so many women in our community, in our Mm -hmm. state and all across the country, step up as activists, step up as organizers, and then step up to, to run for office Mm -hmm. and, and to win. And, um, that's been just this incredible, I think, sea change and mm-hmm. inspiring and, and motivating to to see so many folks just go, okay, it's, yes. it's down to me and I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. Yeah. And and I think what within all the the women who have been stepping up, most of them are have similar backgrounds to you, or like that this is the first time that they're getting involved in politics. And from now that you've gone through that, like you've, you've stepped through, <laughs> mm-hmm. do you, were you surprised at the transition, like how easy it was to move into this political space that maybe seemed separate before? Um, and do you feel like you're, the conversations are happening that need to at the state level? I think I was, I was, uh, surprised and also gratified, I think, to realize mm-hmm what I brought to the table. Um, and I just, I work with so many incredible folks. So mm-hmm. I, I serve alongside people with just the most incredible diversity of backgrounds. We represent these incredibly different districts, right? California, mm-hmm. it's a state of, it's a nation state of 40 million people, right? We're the fifth largest yeah. economy in the world. We, uh, we come to the table with really different backgrounds mm-hmm. with really different perspectives and experience and uh, work incredibly hard to forge a path that that is right for for all of California. And I think mm-hmm. um, for me, a couple of things became sort of evident early on. And I, I, I'm somebody who always, um, I've got a, a background, uh, you know, when I worked, worked in finance and technology, it was always in marketing. In marketing, you're always taught to, you got to look for the unmet need, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think in the same way, when I have entered this this new space and this new sphere, I've been kind of looking for where's the gap that that I can fill. Like, where is mm-hmm. this space where my unique set of skills, my unique background, is going to mm-hmm. add value? And yeah. um, and I think a, a place for me that uh, that has has really stood out is that I think overall California and um, just the, the way that we run our government, I really mm-hmm. do think we could benefit from adopting what is really just kind of standard practice in the business world, right? So like yeah. <laughs> when you're in the business yes. world, you say, okay, we're gonna do we're gonna do this. We've got our business plan for the year. You implement it and you're constantly you're tracking, looking back, mm-hmm. figuring out mm-hmm. what's working, what's not, what do we need to change? What do we how do we need to pivot? Yeah. And not enough of that happens, I think, in mm-hmm. in politics and in 
the bureaucracy of California. So we write a lot of laws. We have a bunch of, we have a lot of press conferences and we don't do a good enough job of looking back and saying, Hey, uh, did that get implemented? (laughs) Number one, (laughs) number two, is, is this great idea actually working in practice? Is Mm -hmm. this, this money that we're investing is the return on that investment, what we expected it to be? Because if not, we need to shift gears. Mm -hmm. We need to stop that program and start a new one. We need to stop spending money on something that's not working and reinvest it somewhere else. And um, so one of the the roles that I've had in the assembly is I chair a committee called the Accountability and Administrative Review Committee. And Mm -hmm. as the chair of that committee, what I've really uh, been pushing for for the last couple of years and will continue to be a big area of focus for me, is that more accountable view of our government. And I think that's incredibly important no matter what. Yes. I think particularly mm-hmm. in the midst of our current uh, current moment and the fact that, that our country and our state is facing a pandemic-induced recession, it's more important now. It's more important now than yes. ever. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's what people, the constituents of these areas really care about, right? Because as you mentioned, we're the fifth largest economy and we seem to have a record of not being very effective with all the money that we have. And it's like, wait, like there's whole countries living off of the same budget that have all sorts of magical things in place that are being provided. Um, there has to be a way to, to be smarter about it. And yeah, I, I'm 100 on board with you of how do we measure it, track it, and stay on the budget that we committed to, right? Because it's really just basic business fundamentals, which um, were unfortunately hijacked, I think, when, when President Trump was running, because I haven't seen a lot of those put into place. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and so I think it's great that that's, that's coming. Um, you know, when you look at your, I saw a lot on your website as well about the homelessness and how mm-hmm. that's such a huge thing in California and especially Orange County. Um, is there like how quickly do you think that 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 homelessness can really be addressed? Um, and we'll just pick Orange County for right now. But are changes happening the right way? Are the things that got implemented with different hotels and things taking people? Are they working? Are things moving in the right direction? I think it's really hard to tell as a a citizen and like what's really going on. <laughs> well, as as you and I'm sure most of the folks listening. Uh, probably know there are on any given night there are more than mm-hmm. seven thousand men, women, and children right here in Orange mm-hmm. County in this this land of so much plenty who find themselves mm-hmm. without a place to sleep, and mm-hmm. that is is certainly a humanitarian crisis. And I think uh, what we've also seen is that it's it's an economic one as well. There was a mm-hmm. study done. Gosh, I guess that's two or maybe even three years ago now. Um, that was was led by UCI in partnership with the Orange County United Way and a number of other um, leading nonprofits to study the cost of homelessness in the county. Mm-hmm. And what they found is that the current cost for Orange County of the homelessness crisis is something like three hundred million dollars a year, mm-hmm. and it would actually cost us less, cost us less, something like two hundred fifty million dollars to house completely house every single homeless individual. And again, I think with, with my uh, perspective as a businesswoman, Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, it's, it's not just that we have an opportunity to do the right thing. It also turns out that it's going to be the thing that is is actually more efficient, right? Yeah. More efficient and more effective. So let's push down that path. And I do think that that Mm -hmm. study was a real turning point for the County. Um, Mm -hmm. And the, the Orange County United Way kind of acted as a convener for just dozens of nonprofit organizations and religious groups and community groups. And there's been such, I think, a huge coordinated push over the last mm-hmm. couple of years. And while the, the problem is still in, enormous, mm-hmm. um, we've made some really good progress in building a system of care here in Orange mm-hmm. County. So um, we have... Uh, the, the capacity of our emergency shelters is now 100%. So we we have 100% of the emergency shelter capacity that's required exists today. Um, mm-hmm. We also are seeing permanent supportive housing capacity coming online in, in, in cities all across the county. And the first of 
um, three health and wellness hubs called Be Well is is underway in the county. And um, so there has been so much good work that has happened. And I, I do think that we're, we've are mm-hmm. we made some tremendous progress and that the system of care is being built. For me personally, I'm, I'm focused really on, on two things mm-hmm. within this. The first is, uh, is our veterans. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I was able in the 2019, uh, 2020 budget, so last year's budget to secure some state funding for a program called Welcome Home OC, which is also in partnership with the Orange County United Way. And the goal of that mm-hmm. program is to end veterans homelessness here. And we've made tremendous progress on that front. And then the other, mm-hmm. the other piece for me, that's a huge priority um, and that underpins not just our, our homelessness crisis, but so many other things is the issue of mental health. And yeah. I think it's it's certainly no secret that um, our, our system of mental health care is, is broken here mm-hmm. in the state of California. And we, we see the fallout every single day in our emergency rooms, in our jails, mm-hmm. and on our streets. And mm-hmm. that's a place where, it, as you said, gosh, we're, we're certainly spending a lot of money on it. It's not that that we're not spending a lot of money on mental health care. It's just that we're not effectively directing those dollars at programs mm-hmm. that actually work. Um, and mm-hmm. so to me, that is uh, an underlying issue that, uh, that that needs needs more focus um, and is, is a top priority for me as we look forward. Yeah. yeah. No, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's, everyone gets impacted by mental health at some capacity and especially in COVID, right? Everyone Mm -hmm. is so much more present to it. Um, So I think there's great, the telehealth shift, I think has been really great for people. I also know it's limited because of it's, a lot of it's divided by state lines, right? So you can't be a, um, an LPC or um, any other therapist and and th- um, do therapy for people in different country uh, states than yourself. So that's mm-hmm. been something really interesting um, to look at. And having a veteran who uh, is a Purple Heart veteran who lives next door to us, who I see struggle with what it means to be reintroduced with a disability and um, you know PTSD, which mm-hmm. is, I think is now changed as PTS because it's not a disability; it's normal. Um, you know, seeing that he's such an amazing human and wants to work hard and wants to be a contributor and is so great as just a, a neighbor in our community, um, uh, making sure that he has a path, like it, it matters to us at a whole different level when you see the people who are struggling with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you for taking on these causes. Um, you know, when you look at your everyday you know, being powerful and what that means. What does it mean to be powerful and to be a powerful lady to you? And how does it directly relate to the work that you're doing now? And I was thinking about that just when I saw the powerful ladies invite on, Mm -hmm. on my calendar and what, what does it mean to have power? And I think for me, it, it means a few things. Number one is it, uh, I think, you know, as an individual means being able to rely on yourself mm-hmm. and um, you know, having folks a- alongside you is great. It's so important. I'm so blessed to have a, a wonderful partner and a wonderful family, wonderful friends and wonderful colleagues. But knowing that you can take care of yourself, mm-hmm. I think is so much a part of uh, of what it means to be powerful. And also knowing that you have the agency to to make changes that you think are important um, in, mm-hmm. in your life, in the world, you know, in, in my case for the community that that I serve. Um, and I think also for me in the context of serving in this role, being a powerful woman also means being in a position to lift other women up mm-hmm. alongside me and uh, to recruit people to work on my team, to recruit people to run for, for other office and to support them in those mm-hmm. elections. That is uh, one of the things that is most incredible about, about the role that I'm in right now. Um, and I think that it is so important for us as women, whether we are uh, you know, powerful women in elected office, powerful mm-hmm. women in the corporate world, powerful women in the philanthropic world, 
realizing that we have an opportunity um, and I think a duty both to mm-hmm. inspire and also to lift up the generation yeah. that is is coming behind us um, mm-hmm. is so, so key. Yeah. Can you think back to a time in your life when you realized how powerful or capable you were, or has this been something that's always just been ingrained in who you are? Well, I'll say that um, as, as I was growing up, uh, and I, I, I love my mom with, with all of my heart. She actually, mm-hmm. um, we just would have celebrated her, uh, her 70th. It would have been her, you know, her 68th birthday a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, she passed away a few years ago, but growing up, I saw that my mom was not powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, mm-hmm. uh, my, my stepfather, she was in an abusive relationship with the man who became my stepfather. and. Um, I saw the ways in which he eroded her sense of self and her sense Mm -hmm. of self-confidence. And I remember from a really, really early and young age, recognizing that and recognizing that I wanted something different for myself and that I Mm -hmm. was determined not to repeat that pattern in my own life. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that that instilled kind of this uh, sort of spine of steel in me and mm-hmm. made me made me a fighter. Um, and I fought yeah. really hard to take care of my mom. I talk, fought, fought really hard to take care of myself. I fought really hard to take care of, of my younger brother and sister. And um, mm-hmm. I've continued, I think, to to be a fighter as I as I've grown up and um, and and as I've I've turned. I've turned, as you said, into a powerful woman. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like eight-year-old you would not be surprised of what you're taking on today. <laughs> <laughs> I think eight-year-old me would be very happy that many of the things that I that I I wished for as a young girl have have come true, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. incredibly, incredibly grateful. Um, mm-hmm. Incredibly grateful. How have the women in your life changed your trajectory and got helped you get to where you are today? Um, I talked a bit about I, I spoke a bit about my my mom, mm-hmm. um, and I think another woman in my family who had a huge influence on me um, at a very young age was my great aunt, who really was more like a grandma to me, um, mm-hmm. and in many ways raised my my mom and her and her two siblings and um my my great aunt her name was claire my aunt claire was the most uh generous and giving and selfless woman i think i've ever known she Mm -hmm. um trained to become a teacher when she was just i think 16 years old and spent her life as an educator both as a classroom teacher and then as a, a principal until she retired, I think sometime, some, you know, sometime in her seventies, but, uh, she was just incredibly generous, incredibly giving. And, um, I think showed me how much power there is in, in selflessness Mm -hmm. and in giving of, in giving of yourself, um, Mm -hmm. because she touched so, so many lives and Mm -hmm. was an inspiration to so many so many children that she, uh, that she taught and so many children that knew her as a principal. So she had a huge impact on me and someone else who also, I think had a really big impact on my life and my trajectory, uh, was my, was a high school teacher of mine. Um, her name was Ms. Lee and Ms. Lee, she was actually a national at one point national teacher of the year. And, Mm -hmm. uh, she was my, she was my, um, AP English, uh, sorry, AP government and uh, history teacher. And Ms. Lee just really inspired us to learn um, in a way that was unlike you know anyone I had ever encountered mm-hmm. when I was 16. She expected us to be engaged in the big questions of the day. We weren't just there to mm-hmm. learn the history books and recite it back to her. We were there mm-hmm. to, to understand what was happening in the world today and what had happened before. And Mm -hmm. um, she was definitely, you know, someone who made me believe that I should apply to to go to Yale University and Mm -hmm. helped me 
realize, I think what I was, what I was capable of, um, mm-hmm. and, and realize what I should be aspiring to achieve. Mm-hmm. The definition of discussion that I love is thinking together. And what I loved growing up and going to college in the New England area was that the idea of Miss Lee and what you, this idea of being part of the conversation and discussing things and that it was okay to disagree. Like being in the Boston area, it was really common to have people disagree and to be at a restaurant or at a bar and like have the conversation and not be not be making enemies, but like really being like, why do you think that way? <laughs> like it would just break out and it was normal to like be having that conversation over a beer in a bar. And it was common for lots of different people in different classes and positions to have those conversations too. And I think there's something so beautiful about that definition, right? Thinking together and how we can change things. Um, and what, what I like, we, and, and mm, sorry, no, sorry to interrupt you, but what I like about what you're, about that point you're making is kind of this idea of healthy disagreement mm. and healthy yes. discourse and healthy debate. And mm-hmm. it really concerns me now because I feel like we are mm-hmm. living in just this such a fractured moment yes. where this idea that we can can disagree but can have a conversation about it and a productive mm-hmm. conversation and you know perhaps even at the end of it reach some kind of common ground and understanding. It feels like right now mm-hmm. we are are living in just this bitter partisan divide. And yes. it's it's like either you're you're with me a hundred percent or you are my enemy. And mm-hmm. um I think for me though, what I really believe is that like that's kind of what we see because those are sort mm-hmm. of the extremes that are most active on Facebook or most active on Twitter. And I really do believe that most people mm-hmm. are somewhere in that middle. Um, yes. And I am, I'm very hopeful that we kind of get away from this notion of like, either you are with me hundred percent or you are my enemy yeah. and I'm going to destroy you at all costs because this kind of politics of mm-hmm. personal destruction and this politics of hate is mm-hmm. the thing that, that concerns me, frankly, more than, than any other challenge that we're facing. And we've got to get back to, like you said, like, mm-hmm. Hey, you know, over a beer in a bar having a disagreement, but still walking away, respecting each other and respecting somebody else's perspective and realizing yes. that we are stronger when we can, can all collaborate and, and work together and, and find some common ground. Yeah. And then I think, you know, part of what made it possible is that if things got too heated, you could always remember like, oh no, we all love the Red Sox. Like, it's okay. We're rooted in that. And I, I think that's what we miss so often in, in conversation today is we're forgetting how, what we're rooted in unity on. Like, I don't know anyone that doesn't want to work hard or to take care of their kids or to take care of their parents. And, you know, people want, you know, whatever the modern version of the American dream is, it, it ultimately means that we get to take care of our families and and get to experience the fruits of whatever, however hard we've worked and the risks that we've taken. And I just think there's such a missing going back to marketing. There's We're not doing a great job as a nation of doing internal PR, right? Like hmm. when we look at how does a, a Nike or an Audi do so great? My, you know, I was 20 years in footwear and apparel. And so I look at how they would beat other people and the first they would convince everyone inside about this amazing product launch, and then they would be doing Mm. it externally. And there's something about, I think what also Canada does really great of like, they have commercials about, this is what it means to be Canadian. And there's this rootedness of, well, we all know we're nice. (laughs) So like, what do we want to talk about on top of that? And I just see such an opportunity to, to bring that back as well, right? Like, even if we just go into the the bubble of Orange County, we all love the weather. We all love going to the beach. You know, we all love um, the things that we have here. And I look at my my own street, my one block. And during the election, every other house probably had a different sign on it representing where people are mm-hmm. at. But during the same amount of time, we were all checking at each other and who needs groceries and you know, a neighbor had to go to the hospital and we, everyone went over to like take care of things. And I kept looking around being like, if our one block is okay, that gives me hope that we can make 
we can expand that. How do we make the street okay? How do we make the town okay? Um, so I guess I know that there's so myself and I'm sure everyone listening are like, how, how do we change that conversation? Do you, do you have any ideas? Do you have a, what, what can we do <laughs> to start changing that conversation? Well, I'll tell you, I don't certainly, um, you changing the occupant of the white house doesn't solve yes. all of these problems, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, these problems we've been talking about certainly don't begin or, or end with Donald Trump, but I am very hopeful that a change of tone kind of mm-hmm. at the very top will cascade down and will have an overall positive fe- effect. And so I do think that the uh, the Biden-Harris administration mm-hmm. is going to set a very different tone. And mm-hmm. I-, I think even when you think about the fact that we are right now, we are in the midst of a you know unprecedented unprecedented mm-hmm. public health crisis. And mm-hmm. this is exactly the time that, in my view, that we should be, rather than kind of seeing this public health crisis turned into, you know, a- another uh, mm-hmm. kind of political debate or political divide, this level of crisis and challenge, I think, reminds us that, as you were saying, of our common, of our common humanity yeah. and of the fact that whatever else happens, I care about my neighbors. I care about my community. I don't really care if you've got an elephant on your t-shirt or a donkey on your t-shirt or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. I I care about you as a person. And mm-hmm. I do think some of that has been lost in kind of the ugly rhetoric that's kind of yes. started at the, at the top. And um, I do think that as we navigate these um, these next several months, and as we hopefully see a vaccine rolled out and see us start to actually defeat this pandemic, that we do have an opportunity to, to, to come together in a new way and do the hard work that's going to be required to build back our communities, she said, one street at a time and, yeah. and stronger and stronger than before. For, for people of the community who want to support you, how critical are the you know, city level positions and politics to implementing things that happen at the state level or supporting what you're trying to roll out from a state level into the communities? They are absolutely critical. And and I think that has been revealed, uh, especially in the midst of, of the COVID-19 mm-hmm. pandemic. I think we have seen just how important it is for us to have good people at every single level of government, from the, the White House to our Congress to state representatives to county to city to folks mm-hmm. on school boards, we need good people who are focused on doing the work and solving problems in the community. And mm-hmm. I'll say that that for the most part, you know, regardless of party, I mm-hmm. work with just incredible people at every single level. But unfortunately, you do see the the outlier where you're like, oh, they don't seem to even realize it's their job to solve <laughs> these problems. Mm-hmm. It's their job to be working for people and to help make people's lives better. There are there are folks at again, at every level where mm-hmm. they see everything as kind of just this like it, it's a very sort of cynical perspective where it's it's this opportunity to turn something into like a political wedge issue so mm-hmm. that they can send a fundraising email or, you know, go on Fox yeah. News, build their profile, get a, a headline in the Orange County Register. And um, that kind that level of cynicism is is horrible. It's disgusting at any point in time, I think, particularly mm-hmm. in the midst of this crisis yeah. um, for those few folks where I that's my assessment of them. I've been particularly, mm-hmm. uh, particularly horrified, but, mm-hmm. um, by and large, I would say that we've got incredible, incredible people, um, representing us at the local level, people who care, people who are working, mm-hmm. working tirelessly to help the, help the workers, the families and the small businesses who are hurting so badly right now. Um, yeah. but it's, I think your, your original question was how much does it matter? And, it matters 
a lot. It matters a ton for us to have good people at mm -hmm. at every level. Yeah. And and for people who wouldn't who don't think that going into one of those roles would be uh, a good fit for them, what are actions they can take to be involved in the political process? Is it um is it holding elected officials um, accountable for what they said they would do? Is it asking great questions at a town hall or at um, open forums? Like how can people participate without um, stepping into one of those roles themselves? There are so many ways to, to get involved mm -hmm. and uh, so many ways to get engaged. Um, so if you are, are into the, the political side of things, volunteering on the campaign mm -hmm. is is so critical especially mm -hmm. for some of these ensuring that you've got good people at the local level mm -hmm. those are grassroots campaigns that run off of volunteer energy volunteer enthusiasm and volunteer commitment so um, mm -hmm. that's that's one way to get involved and engaged um you can also uh, either again on a volunteer basis or or even um as an appointed official, a, a, an appointed commissioner or a, an appointed committee member, you mm -hmm. can serve your city in a way that doesn't require you to, to run mm -hmm. for office and doesn't require some kind of a full-time commitment, but it's still an opportunity for you to, to have a voice on um, a, a subject and in an area that you care about and where maybe you've got some expertise mm -hmm. to give, whether that's finance or, or parks and recreation or housing and, mm -hmm. and human services. There are so many opportunities for appointments to, to city commissions and uh, city boards. Um, another way that's uh, incredibly valuable to get involved is in nonprofit organizations. And we have got just such a dynamic network mm -hmm. of nonprofits working here all across Orange County. And one thing to me that particularly in, in the midst of COVID-19, I think what we have seen um, alongside this unprecedented and terrible public health crisis, we've seen people get involved and get engaged in in big and in small ways mm -hmm. to do something to help their neighbors, to do something to to help the community navigate this. And um, whether that's volunteering at a at a food bank, um, you know, volunteering to uh, to help support the education of, of young children, volunteering to, to help um, address the homeless crisis, as you said. There mm -hmm. are opportunities for people to get engaged in, in so many areas and mm -hmm. to play a role and um, be, part of, be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as we're looking into 2021, and I think we're all excited to powerfully wrap up this year and start fresh <laughs> after what um, has happened over and over again to, you know, whether it's my clients or just friends and family, you know, it feels like we have had to level up a decade worth in one year, morally, you know, socially, economically, whatever it is. Um, and as you're going into 2021, what's, what are you looking forward to um, both in your role as an assemblywoman, but also for yourself personally? Well, let me start first with um, with my priorities as mm -hmm. uh, as your as your representative in, in the California yeah. State Assembly. And um, there, there's really three, and I'll mm -hmm. touch on those briefly. But um, number one continues to be COVID nineteen response, and mm -hmm. um, there has been an absolutely Herculean effort underway to ensure that California is prepared and mm -hmm. that uh, we are able to to respond to this pandemic, both in the spring surge and, and what we're seeing right now with this fall surge. Um, I, I increasingly, and when I think about uh, the, the COVID crisis, I'm increasingly focused actually on our schools and mm -hmm. ensuring that uh, we are able to open our schools safely and get kids back mm -hmm. into the classroom safely for yeah for in-person learning. Um, what we have, have seen over the last several months is the vast majority of our kids are still learning online. Um, we've got mm -hmm. the, most of the schools that are, are back in person for in-person instruction are our private schools serving mm -hmm. 
our wealthy students, we're seeing the kids that can really least afford it get get left further and further behind. Mm -hmm. And what we've also seen is that the schools that have reopened, both here in Orange County, all across the country and all across the world, we are seeing that schools are not super spreader sites. We are seeing Mm -hmm. that we are able to take smart and careful precautions to keep our our students, Mm -hmm. our uh, teachers, other staff members and the community at large safe, which I think is really, really encouraging. And Mm -hmm. so I think in California, we've got to ensure that we are, as of of January, pushing hard to to reopen Mm -hmm. schools, ensure that they're open safely, but ensure that we're doing everything we can to, uh, to, to serve the the kids of California. Um, So that that's certainly one top priority for me. Mm -hmm. Um, Another area of focus is economic recovery. And um, as I, as I mentioned, as I think folks know, we are officially in a pandemic induced recession. We know that Mm -hmm. the steps we've taken uh, to respond to COVID-19, we know that that saved lives. We also know that it's been devastating for, Mm -hmm. for workers, for families, for small businesses all across the state. And Mm -hmm. um, so I'm part of a a working group on economic recovery, and I'm really focused Mm -hmm. on Um, both infrastructure investments and also on workforce development programs and ensuring that we are are putting Californians back to work. And then a third priority for me um, in my first term and and a continued priority is environmental policy. And uh, Mm -hmm. particularly particularly given the community that I represent, addressing the threat of sea level rise and mm-hmm. mitigating and doing a better job of addressing the, the threat of wildfire risk. So yeah. those are, are my uh, my legislative priorities for next year. Are, are, as I said, COVID response, uh, mm-hmm. economic recovery, and environmental policy. And um, personally, I am, uh, I'm looking forward to, I think like everyone, I am really <laughs> looking forward to 2021. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think turning the uh, turning the chapter from from 2020. Um, but mm-hmm. when I reflect back on, I think my first term in office, and certainly the past year, while I never would have expected that I would be serving in the midst of this mm-hmm. unprecedented public health crisis, I didn't run for office because I wanted to you know, go to events with the, the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce or post for pictures on Instagram. (laughs) Like I ran for office because I wanted to serve this community. And Mm -hmm. um, the reality is that that's never been, that that needs never been more urgent or or more Mm -hmm. profound. And so I am more committed than ever uh, to this job um, and and to this work. And Mm -hmm. um, I think personally, as we think about moving through the COVID-19 era Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) and look forward to a time when we've got a vaccine and when we can resume some level of normalcy. I am, I think, just really looking forward to the the kind of in-person connections that I think we've been missing in so many aspects. And a lot of the things Mm -hmm. that I love to do, I've been able to to continue doing virtually, but Mm -hmm. there's something about being in, you know, being in, in a yoga class with a bunch yes. of other people and having that sense of connectedness, being at a, a concert, you know, an experience in live music and being mm-hmm. in the moment with, with a crowd of other people, um, being able yeah. to have wonderful dinner parties and just, yeah. you know, celebrate with milestones with, with groups of friends. Um, so those are some of the things I think I'm looking forward to mm-hmm. most when I think about, when I think about 2021. Well, and it makes it so much easier to. Uh, feel like a community when you actually get to be in the presence of the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, We ask everyone on the podcast where they rank themselves on the powerful lady scale. If zero is average everyday human and 10 is the most powerful lady possible, where would you rank yourself today? And how do you think you rank yourself on an average day? I will say, let's see, I'll... I'll give myself like a seven and a half. I'm going to do a seven and Mm -hmm. a half probably today and, and on an average day. Um, I think that there's, I think 
that there's there's still room for me to grow and that yeah. there are opportunities for me to uh, to continue to become a more a more powerful lady which uh or is actually an op- opportunity that I welcome and look forward mm-hmm. to and I love I have always loved challenging myself and mm-hmm. kind of taking on on new hills and uh and new challenges so um, when I think about what I need, the work I need to do to get from a seven and a half to uh, to that that number that uh, that number ten, mm-hmm. I think I find that m- more exciting than I do yep. than I do daunting. Uh, I ran for office and I ran to to represent this community because I felt like we were getting sh- shortchanged in Sacramento, mm-hmm. and um, I'm proud of the work that I have done over the past two years to change that. Mm-hmm. I've brought millions of dollars back to the district. I've passed important legislation on uh, mm-hmm. addressing the challenges of climate change, uh, legislation to to help small business owners, uh, legislation to improve access to health care. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really been an incredible, it has been an incredible honor and privilege to do this job and to represent our community. And I am incredibly humbled and grateful that uh, the the residents of Orange County have again elected me to continue to do this job Mm -hmm. and do this work. And I think in terms of, you know, any advice that I would Mm -hmm. would have to give, um, and particularly, I guess it's particularly for young women who are considering whether or not to to run for office, whether or not to kind of put up your hand and and do that. And Mm -hmm. uh, it can be daunting to put yourself out there. It can feel really scary to to mm-hmm. run for office. And what I always say um, when anyone asks me, like, should I do this? Should I think about it? It's if there is that little voice inside of you that says, I think I'd be good at this. I think mm-hmm. I should do this. I would always say, go for it and do it. And uh, particularly to particularly to to women and and to to young women. Um, We need Mm -hmm. more women in leadership, um, whether that's in our boardrooms or our courtrooms or our uh, legislative chambers. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's so important to to believe in yourself and to put yourself out there and uh, and to take risks to ensure that um, you're becoming you're becoming your most powerful self. Well, I love that. Thank you so much for all the work you do for all of us in Orange County and California and for stepping up, right? For being that yes. Um, you know, it's great to have you as both a leader and also, you know, inspiration on what is possible and to have confidence that there is somebody in politics really representing us who um, isn't a politician, who isn't there for any other reasons than actually making the impact that they're there to be. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you, Kara. It was wonderful to join you. Thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, thank you for all that you do to to help and uh, support and showcase Powerful Lady. Wherever you live in the world, I hope you heard Cotty's invitation to get up, get involved, and hold our elected officials accountable. You are the change you wish to see in the world. What will you do in this new year? What steps will you take to create the world you want to live in? If you're stuck or have questions on how to do that, or you're just looking for support, reach out to me and the team here at hello at the We'll do our best to point you in the right direction. To connect, support, and follow Kati, you can follow her in lots of places. Instagram is, of course, always easy, and that is at ASM Kati. She has a Twitter link, a YouTube, Facebook, websites, and she even has shared her email with us. You can find all of that at thepowerfulladies.com forward slash podcast in this episode's show notes. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Powerful Ladies podcast. There are so many ways you can get involved and get supported with fellow Powerful Ladies. First, subscribe to this podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts. Give us a five-star rating and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. Join the Powerful Ladies Thrive Collective. This is the place where Powerful Ladies connect, level up, and learn how to thrive in business and life. 
Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page. And of course, visit our website, thepowerfulladies.com. I'd like to thank our producer, composer, and audio engineer, Jordan Duffy. Without her, this wouldn't be possible. You can follow her on Instagram at Jordan K. Duffy. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, I hope you're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love.